It's like, what are you going to be when you grow up? That one. It used to be very real, didn't it? Some of you must remember those days when people asked those questions. What are you going to be when you grow up? And we all finally figured out we weren't going to, so it was irrelevant. But it, for a long time, it seemed like a terribly important question, didn't it? I spent years wondering what I'd be when I grew up, and I never predicted I'd be this, I'll tell you. I mean, there's no way, even like when I grew up, I never predicted this one. See, so how can you predict? All right, welcome to another Here and Now podcast with Ram Dass. I am your host, Jackie Dobrinska. I'm the Director of Education and Community for Love, Sir, Remember Foundation. And we have another really great episode for you this week. It's called Being Truth. And I particularly love this one because I just find it has so much humor and joy and truth in it. So this particular lecture comes from a workshop that Ramdas gave at the Ojai Foundation in the 1980s. And the Ojai Foundation put together these series of workshops over several years, and they were affectionately known as Wizards Camp, which is such a great name. And it included folks like Ramdas and Thich Nhat Han and Joanna Macy, Joseph Campbell, um, Melodoma Somay, Roshi Joan Halifax, and many, many others. And starting soon, you're going to hear some of these lectures trickle into our guest podcast. So make sure you check those out. But the ones that Ram Dass gave, you're going to find those here. And in this one, he talks about how do we know what is our part to play? Um, How do we hang out with our unique and often very neurotic selves? Um, How do we learn to let ourselves be? To not think we have to annihilate our mind or our ego or our somebodyness, but rather learn just to be with them without identifying so heavily. It's about the creating space in our models and tapping into higher consciousness and intuitive minds, our intuitive minds. And I don't know about you, but I think this is one of the reasons that I really love Ramdas so much is allowing for our humanness, our humanity, while also reminding us that we're so much more than that. And I think that's really an important gift in this day and age. So as always, we're interested in what you have to say about it. So we offer these lectures, but then we also provide space for you to come together in community and talk with others and ask your questions. So the next Ram Dass virtual fellowship is Tuesday, October 25th at 8 p.m. To get the links, you sign up at ramdas.org slash fellowship. And then a few days before the event, you'll get the links in your inbox. Also, a quick reminder, Brilliant Disguise, that movie that recently came out, is still in theaters. And if you don't know, uh, it's about Casey Tuari. And he was one of the main devotees of Neem Karoli Baba, who was Ram Dass's guru. And he really helped the Westerners connect to the teaching. Uh, Krishna Das talks about him a lot in his podcast, Pilgrim Heart. You can find out more about the movie, where it's playing, special guest speakers, including Krishna Das, and potential community screenings at ramdas.org slash brilliant. And lastly, wherever you are, I'm going to invite you to take a nice, big, deep breath. And then I'm going to invite you to take another. It's pretty amazing how powerful the breath is to get us present, to get us out of our minds, to calm the nervous system, and really to open the heart. And I think most of us would have loved to have this woven into our lives from a very early age instead of having to relearn it as adults. So that's sort of the intention of this new children's book that has come out called Penguin's Breath. It's about a penguin who learns mindful breathing in order to calm his fears. And it's written by this lovely woman, Debbie Nutley. She's a meditation teacher who was certified by Dharma Moon and Tibet House. She was also trained at mindful schools to teach mindfulness to children. So Dharma Moon is the school founded by David Nickturn, who you might know from one of our other podcasts on the Be Here Now Network called Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck. 
and it's a great, great training. Um, the book is designed for four to seven-year-olds, and it's received numerous accolades, including a red ribbon by the Wishing Shelf Book Awards, an editor's pick selection by Book Life Reviews, and an indie books we love selection by Love Reading for Kids. You can find Penguin's Breath on the internet, and I'll spell it for you. It's P-E-N-G-W-E-E apostrophe S, Breath. So we, before we jump into this great lecture, I'm just going to invite you to take a few more deep breaths, get present into the here and now, and open to that field of loving awareness. As we hear from our sponsor, it's the reason that we are able to provide these podcasts to you. So thank you for your time. May these teachings benefit your life and ripple out into the world and be a benefit for all. Namaste and blessings. We are an old people, we're a new people. We've been gathering under the trees in the gentle breeze. To share the wonderment of it all. For ever so long. This entire gathering is such an ancient ritual. Asking ourselves those questions for which silence is the only answer. Learning to trust that part of our being. That goes beyond all words. Feel the moment. Tune to your senses. Hear the gentle breeze. Feel the earth. The sun. quality of the gathering of the spirit. Let the feelings and the images, the sensations come and let them go. start to expand outward. Until the, the sounds, including the sound of my voice, are within our body. That this whole scene of all of these beings gathered together is as if in miniature. Something we hold in the palm of our heart. For we are dialoguing heart to heart.
We are talking to ourselves. We are listening to the sounds which we don't hear through our ears. We are understanding the wisdom that we cannot comprehend with our brain. We are feeling the love that transcends emotion. We are tuning to the energy that knows no limit. The airplane, trucks, cars, wind, sun, bodies, leaves, all the dance of forms, nothing to be pushed, nothing to be held on to. It all is just the way it is. Just allow. In this our vastness, allow the universe to unfold. can rise to. So though you and I are gathered in a, a country of, of affluence, and we are sitting together in a moment of peace, We are coming together to share an awareness and to understand what our unique part is in the total design of things. We are enjoying the luxury of this moment. Many of our sisters and brothers at this moment are so busy warding off starvation, are so busy avoiding the terrors that are created by the minds of humans. Are so lost in the struggle of survival. that they cannot be with us today. But we can be with them. And we can bring them here by not excluding them. By realizing that what we represent is just a pseudopod of the totality that is the human play. But this is not an exclusive gathering. We aren't special. We are merely part of the dance, and this is our part. To think of someone at this moment starving or someone at this moment being tortured. You 
is not to create guilt. Although that may be the first reaction. Not to create shame that we aren't doing more, although that might be a first reaction. But rather to put into perspective what part we are playing. For if you are busy with guilt or shame, you won't be able to hear what your part is. Last year I was in Florence, Italy, hanging out with Michelangelo. And I could imagine, as I studied the history of Florence and heard about the Medicis and the uprisings and the, the mass demonstrations on the steps of the church, the, I could imagine people coming to Michelangelo and saying, Mike, um, hey, leave all that stone alone, would you please? I mean, there's important stuff to do. We've got to go down and protest against the Medicis. And Mike's saying, look, I'd like to, but, you know, I've just got to work on this. I've got this feeling that this stone, there's in this stone, there's a, something that is coming forth. Florence needed the people to protest the inequities of government. It also needed Michelangelo to work on the stone. And each part of the human dance enriches the other parts. How can we possibly, in the face of all of the possibilities, know what it is we're supposed to do? What we're doing here on Earth? What's our work? The answer is we can't know it. We can only be our work. A beautiful image when Mahatma Gandhi was in a train pulling out of a station. And the reporter rushed up and said, Mahatma Ji, give me a message to take back to the people of the village. And the train was moving and he just could scribble on a piece of, of a paper bag and he tore it off and he handed it out the window. And he had written, my life is my message. Your life, my life at this moment, this is our message. All of our wonderful intentions are our mind. This is what we got. This is where we are at this moment. And to hear who we are and what our part is, the first thing we have to do is acknowledge what is. Most of us live all too frequently in what I will be when, or if only, or as soon as, as soon as the kids are grown, I can meditate. As soon as I finish my education, as soon as I get through puberty, uh, as soon as I get another wife, as soon as I get another husband, as soon as I, as soon as I move to Ojai, uh, as soon as I move out of Ojai. Uh, <laughs> as soon as I have more money, as soon as I have security, then it'll all come together and I'll know who I am and what I'm supposed to do. Don't be silly. <laughs> I learned a long time ago, if I was neurotic in New York, I'd be neurotic in Chicago. <laughs> so first you open to what is. 
you say, okay, this is it. Everything in my life up to this moment has been for this. This is it. Don't like it? Stop identifying so much with the judge. Here come the judge. I don't like it. I don't like who I am. But therapy will change it. <laughs> no, this is what you got. First, allow it before you get too busy judging it. I mean, just realize what old friends your neuroses are. I mean, they're old friends of mine, I know. I've got incredible, I've had them for 50 years now, it seems like. Some of them came when I was six months old. We've been hanging out together ever since. They haven't gone away. Their role is slightly different. They're instead of now, instead of the ruling class, they're just sort of old buddies that drop by for tea. <laughs> I didn't suddenly get healthy. Self-actualized. Huh. But somewhere along the way, I just started to allow me to be. I just said, okay, this is what I got. Because all the time up until then, I was always pushing and shoving. Pushing, shoving, and judging and complaining. God, why did you screw up? Why did you make me particularly have this peculiar sexual weirdity? I mean, Jesus, I mean, what, what have I done to deserve this? Why did I have to go bald so young? I mean, I see people here that are as old as I am, and they're not bald. My father's got a full head of hair. He's 84. God, what, what, what have you done? What machinations? But first, if you're going to hear the message, the unique message of your incarnation, the unique message of your manifestation, the unique message in which you will find the emptiness, the form in which you will find the emptiness, you must open to the form. You must allow the form. It's interesting. We look at this beautiful tree and that magnificent tree, and that wonderful tree, and that tree, and that tree is a little smaller than that tree. But we don't sit around necessarily every time we look at trees judging that oaks are better than elms. Trees somehow, we allow trees to be. We allow rivers to be, we allow rocks to be, but when we get near humans, <laughs> The judging mind, more beautiful, ugly, older, younger, fatter, thinner, richer, poorer, smarter, stupid, neurotic, happy, adjusted. We can't stop. It's like an addiction. And to see through the veils, one has to extricate oneself from one's judging mind. It's like you hear that sound of the truck or the motorcycle, the car. You can say, oh God, you know, this scene is so idyllic if only they didn't have that road out there. <laughs> of course, you came here by that road. <laughs> you were a few minutes ago polluting the same sound area, but now you're not doing it, so it's an interference. Okay. But it's all part of the play. Sounds are just energy patterns. And some of them you call beautiful, and then, like, I could never tell. I used to have poison ivy all the time. I know there's poison oak around here. I could never tell whether I was in ecstasy or I was in pain. It was that when you scratched, you know, that feeling? <laughs> I could never quite tell.
to allow yourself to be just where you are, just the way it is. means that you have to allow yourself to be independent of the models you have of how you should be. In the spiritual journey, you often see people who um, are busy becoming Buddha, or they're Christ in training, or they're Mother Teresa's in drag. You know, I mean, you can feel that thing happening. You can see all these different people you can see the models they have in their heads of who they're imitating. And often it's like that delicious story, which I haven't, I think I've only told it once this year. I told it all the time before. So I've got to just, it's just the, I think it should come today. It, it's, it's the, it's on back the tailor. He really should be here. Somebody here doesn't know the Zumbach story. That must be why I'm telling it. <laughs> because this um, this man in a small village became uh, came into. He finally made it. It was in Vilna, somewhere like this. This should be told with a Yiddish is a Yiddish story, but I won't do that. Um, and. Um, and so he decided to have a very good suit made. And there was really one extraordinary tailor named Zumbach. So he went to Zumbach and he ordered a very special suit. And Zumbach made the suit. And when the man went in to try on the suit, he put it on and he found that this sleeve was about two inches longer than this sleeve. And he said, Zumbach, he said, I don't want to complain. But he says, this sleeve is longer than this sleeve. Zumbach said, my good man. There is nothing wrong with a suit. It's the way you're standing. If you stand like that, you see the suit fits perfectly. Yeah. And at this point, he said, well, you see, all this material, my wife hates it when there's all that material in the back of the suit. Could you take that out? And Zumbeck said, look, there's nothing wrong with a suit if you stand like this. You see, it fits perfect. So finally, the suit fit perfectly. And the man left with his new suit. He could hardly breathe. <laughs> and he got on the bus. And somebody came up to him and said, what a beautiful suit. I bet Zumbach the tailor made that suit. <laughs> and the man said, how did you know? He said, because only somebody as skilled as Zumbach could make a suit that fits somebody that's as crippled as you are. <laughs> And that's the sort of expressions you get on people that are busy becoming somebody. They're in somebody training. I'm going to grow up and be a computer engineer. You can see it. You can see them growing into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what are you going to be when you grow up? It's that one. It used to be very real, didn't it? Some of you must remember those days when people asked those questions. What are you going to be when you grow up? And we all finally figured out we weren't going to, so it was irrelevant. But it, for a long time, it seemed like a terribly important question, didn't it? I spent years wondering what I'd be when I grew up, and I never predicted I'd be this, I'll tell you. I mean, there's no way, even like when I grew up, I never predicted this one. See, so how can you predict? Take us, take us. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, there are no models for what you are. Your attempt to become a model is merely your mind trying to stuff a sleeping bag into one of those little sacks. <laughs> and it keeps leaking out over the edges all the time. <laughs> hmm. 
you and I and everybody in this universe, all forms are unique. Have unique karma, have unique dharma. And you and I have to listen to hear what our part is. Free of guilt, free of shame, free of judgment. Just listen and hear. At this moment, you and I are collaborating in building a septic tank. That's who we are. Who are you? I'm a septic tank builder. How do you do? And you have, you notice that your role keeps shifting all the time. Before you were a driver. Sometimes you're a lover. When you say to somebody, what do you do? My usually answer is talk to you. That's what I'm doing at this moment when you ask me, what do you do? I'm talking to you. See, we all started out, we all got born, and we became, we were trained by somebody's to become somebody. It got more subtle as time went on, but it still worked that way. There was still, un, there was still conditional love and socialization. I mean, in my father's day, my father's parents stuck my father up on a table and said, you're going to be a lawyer. Talk to us like you're talking to a jury when he was about four years old. And sure enough, he became a lawyer. I mean, it seems predictable. But you and I have been in somebody training for a long time. And when the somebody training doesn't work well enough, they say, well, the ego hasn't evolved enough. And you need... Therapy in order to develop your ego, your strength, your sense of identity, your sense of somebodyness. Because a lot of us more recently seem to be getting through early socialization with a rather confused image of who we are. It's interesting that after we finished becoming somebody, only then does the journey start that you and I are on today. To put it succinctly, you have to become somebody to be nobody. If you try to become nobody too soon in an incarnation, it gets very weird. And a lot of young people have to go back into becoming somebody, which we call getting grounded in the trade. <laughs> before they can go off to La La Land. <laughs> that you have to get rooted in, in, on earth, in your incarnation, in your somebodyness, to use the incarnation properly to become free. If your freedom in any way denies your incarnation, denies what is, Denies the fact that you are at this moment in some form or other, or you think you are. Then you're only enjoying half of the dance. You're just attached to the emptiness or the formlessness. And you're not appreciating the exquisiteness of the form. I was about to say... Then you're only experiencing half of God. But then I realized that I was in Krishnamurti's territory. And I got to watch myself. I got to clean up my act. I got to put God in quotes. <laughs> See, I love God. God has a big, long beard. <laughs> she does indeed, yes. <laughs> Uh, I've just got to share with you because it runs through my mind that Krishnamurti was asked whether he would like to visit with Ramdas. <laughs> and he said, I don't want to meet any Westerner whose name is Ramdas. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that. It's, just, it's so Krishnamurti esque. 
Ish. Krishnamurti said, destruction is essential, not of buildings and things, because here we are on the new campus of the school that uh, comes out of his heart mind, not of buildings and things, but of all the psychological devices and defenses, God's beliefs, dependence upon priests, experiences, knowledges, and so on. Without destroying all these, there cannot be creation. It is only in freedom that creation comes into being. I think I wouldn't use the word destroy. I would use, or I'd say, destroy the identification or the attachment to these things. I would not destroy beliefs. I would merely enjoy them as servants. I would not destroy rituals. I would delight in them. I would not destroy God. I would use God as a vehicle to come into the fullness of the moment. Methods are all traps. The methods of yoga, of union, of coming into the one, of going from your somebodyness into the oneness beyond your separate somebodyness. They are all traps, and for them to work, you must get trapped, and you just hope that they self eject. Because if you are too busy protecting yourself from getting trapped, you are indeed trapped. <laughs> In fact, any stance you take is just another stance. And sooner or later, it must be let go of, because to be in nobody training means to realize that finally you have jumped out of an airplane, you have no parachute, but there's no earth. It's free form. That's where the creation starts. Let me, all, let me say it all very simply in steps, because I know I'm just sort of dancing around this morning. Who you are, in the Ramana Maharshi question, who am I? Ramana Maharshi was a great Indian saint. And for 40 years, he sat on in Tiruvannamali in India, on Mount Arunachala. And he, people came to him, and constantly the question he asked was, Vichara Atma, who are you? What is the nature of your being? Who are you? Who are you? And whatever you answered was just another concept. And the way that method worked was you would go through the root of what's called neti neti, not this, not this. So you'd say, I am not like, for example, when you are reading a book, you may be reading the book and you get so fascinated reading the book that somebody walks in the room and you don't hear them walk in the room because you were so busy reading. Now, when that happened, their footsteps produce the waves or, vib or patterns of, that um, affected the cochlear membrane, that affected the auditory canal, that affected the auditory nerves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and it all went in. It all was working fine, whether it was particles or waves. But there was nobody listening because you were busy looking. And you can do that with every one of your senses, and you can see that indeed, if you are not looking, you're still here, 
you still are. So you go through, I am not my senses. I'm not the sense of sight. I am not the sense of hearing. I am not the t- sense of taste, the sense of smell. I am not the, the feeling, the kinesthesis. And then you go through the internal organs. I am not the, and as we're transplanting more and more, it's obvious you're not those. <laughs> I'm not the heart. I am not the this. I am not the that. And then I am not the organs of expulsion and retention, and I am not the organs of, of motor action, the arms and the legs and so on, because we can lose those and we're still around. And the last line of this little game you play, if your mind is powerful enough, is I am not this thought. See, at that point, you have extricated yourself from all, everything but the thinking mind. And here you are, you and I have grown up in a culture in which cogito ergo sum. Some of you must remember that. I think, therefore I am. And here we are, it turns out, that isn't the way it is. It's I am, and I think. Because you and I in this brave new world have grown up to worship our prefrontal lobes. <laughs> we have grown up to worship our rational analytic mind and its stepchild technology. And everywhere we look are its manifestations, except here. But most of us live in houses, live in cities, drive in cars, look at television, and it's all processed through those frontal lobes. The frontal lobes can extend outward, and they can go to the moon, and they can send messages back and look at themselves. It's awesome. It's absolutely breathtaking what the human intellect can do. So it's not any surprise that we ended up identifying with it because it's the most powerful thing we've got going. So we end up saying, I'm my intellect. Look how strong I am. I am my intellect. I am a human and I have this symbolic capacity which animals don't have. And with this symbolic capacity, I can remember, I can have a history, I can have a future, I can understand where I am in time and space. What incredible power. I mean, I thought I had something going with my prehensile capacities, my thumb and index finger opposition. It's nothing compared to these prefrontal lobes. I mean, have you really tried using it yet? It's incredible. It's the greatest thing going. I mean, I... And then to hear, I am not the thinking mind. I am not this thought. I am not the thought I am. Because a symbol is not the thing itself. It is merely a symbolic representation of the thing itself. And any way you describe yourself or talk about yourself is a symbolic representation. And it is not the thing itself. It's the finger pointing at the moon. It's not the moon. But because you can measure and you can, you can implant in the cortex and you can get behavioral correlates and you can build a body of knowledge about the intellect and its manifestation, you end up thinking that that's what you are and it's real. It's like the drunk who is looking for the watch under the street lamp and somebody comes along and helps him look and they don't find it and finally says, well, where exactly did you lose it? And the drunk says, up in the alley. Well, what are you looking here for? And he says, because there's a light here. And that's the predicament we find ourselves in. That we measure what's measurable and focus on what's knowable. And in the process, we lose a connection through our being. We lose our connection to that way of knowing the universe, 
that is not through the rational, analytic thinking mind. We don't destroy that mind. And one of the mind, that mind's products is what we call our ego, which is our structure for functioning on the physical, psycho-physical plane. We don't destroy it. We merely change our relationship to it. Your personality is not going to go away when you get enlightened. It's going to be an available handmaiden for you to use when you are galumphing around on the psychological plane. Your legs aren't going to fall off when you become enlightened. They will be there available to walk around when you want to work on the physical plane. But you don't have to be busy being legs all the time or your personality all the time. In chauvinistic days of yore, <laughs> we treated the kind of knowing that I'm talking about, the kind of wisdom, the kind of being, we called it intuitive and we thought it was weak and mushy and happened only to women. And we said, men think, women intuit. And a woman would say, I don't know how I know, I just know. And we'd scornfully look. But it turned out that that intuitive mind was our higher connection. And that the intellectual, with all the powers the intellect had, it was only a small subsystem. And that there was a meta system in, of which we are part, the Tao or whatever you want to call it, that we could not know objectively through our intellect, we could only be part of and manifest out of its harmonious being. A rock doesn't have to think how to be rock-like. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.